Hello, good day. My name is Vadim Klimov, and I'm the SAP integration architect focused on some on-premise and uh, cloud services, uh, such as cloud platform integration. And welcome to this session, or welcome to the on online track, and I hope you enjoyed it so far, and uh, you will enjoy the next coming sessions uh, today. So this session will be focused on uh, performance optimization and performance management uh, in SAP Cloud Platform integration. So what we will speak about is how we can uh, measure and how we can benchmark um, custom code that we put in CPI. We will not look into the optimization techniques but because this topic is way uh, broader, but we will look into how we can spot some uh, performance uh, killers and how we can identify uh, where the optimization uh, might worth to be done. So before any optimization starts, and uh, before we really are ready to unfold uh, tools and um, uh, dive deep in the problem, uh, we have to uh, answer a few uh, basic questions. And the first of them is, why uh, do we optimize? The optimization, especially in such uh, complex um, services and software as uh, SAP Cloud Platform Integration, uh, it's not an, uh, it might become not an easy task, and it might take quite a lot of efforts and uh, time both to identify performance lake or performance issue and also to come up with some uh, robust and better performance solutions. So uh, if there is no answer why we want to optimize, probably there is no need to optimize something. A good example is uh, if we have some interface and migration scenario where um, it's not highly critical, time critical, and it's just uh, some replication of data which happens uh, in the background. And if we see that it runs, let's say, 10 seconds, and if it's expected to run within an hour, probably it makes no uh, sense to make uh, to run sub-second optimization sessions. The second one is uh, what to optimize. So commonly in CPI, we will see that uh, flows are quite complex and they consist of multiple uh, processing steps. And not always it's easier, uh, it's easy to understand which steps we have to optimize. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what particular we would like to optimize in the flow. Not always uh, the end-to-end -end flow optimization will be focused on CPI itself. It might be focused on the application side or uh, network uh, connections and so on and so on. The next one is uh, after we decided uh, which particular um, aspect of the integration we would like to optimize, we need uh, to look into how we're going to measure. So what uh, measurements we're going to do are firstly uh, to measure baseline uh, scenario and then to see if we improve or if we degrade performance um, of the uh, scenario. So uh, uh, there will be multiple uh, aspects, multiple uh, KPIs that can be measured, and we will see some of them across this presentation. Next one, after we decided what we would like to measure, we need to understand where we would like to measure and if the environment that we use for measurements and for benchmarking is representative enough. The first thing that comes to, my, uh, to, uh, to our mind is uh, let's make measurements in uh, CPI itself, which is quite good starting point. And CPI itself provides some tools to make uh, this happen. But when we look into some um, deep dive uh, analysis, it might be that um, tooling that is exposed by uh, CPI to customers might not be sufficient uh, to look into some internals. So then the question arises uh, how we can emulate the environment, uh, how we can run the interface or parts of uh, measured parts of the interface somewhere else, and if the environment that uh, we use for measurements uh, is relevant and representative. For complex environments, there's commonly a huge pitfall because uh, composition and um, installation uh, of representative environment is it's on its own is quite a significant task. The next question is uh, which techniques and tools we would like to use. So after we know in which environment we uh, want to run uh, measurements and benchmarks, we need to understand um, uh, and get prepared with the tools that are available in that environment. So different environments will provide different capabilities. And um, what we will look into this presentation is uh, mostly how we can isolate uh, some measured uh, custom code uh, and how we can do measurements in a local environment. And the last but not least is how we interpret measurement results. So after we decided what to measure, we understood where to measure, how to measure, or we run uh, measurement sessions, we got some results we need. Uh, it's not just figures that we get. We need to understand what's hidden behind those figures and uh, how using different knobs and techniques we can uh, change uh, performance, how we can change the interface, 
and how uh, new figures uh, will reflect uh, that. So um, let's let, let me switch to the CPI first and see what what is available uh, in CPI out of the box uh, for the measurements. Uh, in sake of demonstration, we will have a simple uh, integration flow, which uh, consists of only one uh, processing step. And given that we are focused on measurement of custom code, uh, most commonly custom code in CPI will be a script, which can be developed either in Groovy or in JavaScript. In across this presentation, I will use example in Groovy. And in this presentation, we will not focus on um, other areas like uh, development of adapters because they are lesser common in uh, CPI developments. So what we have is we have an integration flow with a one step. Uh, I've already deployed it to the runtime and I can send a um, sample post request to it and um, uh, do some uh, measurements of this step. So what we will do is we will uh, look into how we can optimize this particular step. To make that happen, I will increase the lock level to trace so that we have um, more details about I should, um, if, um, about executor step. In particular, uh, a CPI out of the box provides us ability in the trace mode uh, to look into durations of every steps and uh, of every step, and this is exactly what we're looking for. Now I fire the request, and the request will be um, just a single string in the body, and in the background we will calculate a Fibonacci number for the given um, uh, sequential number. Probably it's the first and might be the last time that we really need Fibonacci calculations in uh, CPI. It's not something common and it's not business case, but uh, that's a good example uh, that we will follow across this demo because it will uh, it's quite illustrative for some performance aspects. So we see that we got response, we got current timestamp, fixed code, uh, fixed text from the input, and we got a calculated Fibonacci number. If I now navigate uh, to the operations field of the monitor, then in the graphical view I can see duration of the step. That's the most basic and the quickest way how we can see um, how long the step uh, took us to uh, run time to get processed. Here we go. And we can see that this step took 718 milliseconds. It doesn't say uh, more than that. But what we can do, so for example, we need to measure not a single step as such, but we would like to measure some uh, specific code block. And this is where I will look into the code itself. Uh, so we have um, the part that constructs um, the output. Uh, we use JSON Builder for this. Uh, we use Clojure that makes calculation on the Fibonacci number. And if we are not satisfied with the measurement of the duration of the step in CPA, and we would like to go um, on uh, code of block level, then what we can do is we can make calculation of the duration as a delta between start and end. And in here, I use the standard GTK functions to get uh, milliseconds, around milliseconds. And then we can put it somewhere in the message or in the exchange. So in this particular uh, example, we have mainly three options where we can put it. We can put it in the exchange property. Uh, then it will be visible when we look into uh, in the monitor in the debug or trace level. Uh, we can uh, we can put it in the header in MPL header, not the message header, but MPL custom header. A uh, good point is that uh, it will be visible even in info work level. So we will not need to make it more verbose. And the last option is we can put it in MPL property. Um, in this case, we will need to increase log level to debug or to trace to be able to see it. Some ways, for example, uh, usage of exchange property, we will not even need to deploy uh, the iFlow to runtime uh, since we will be able to use uh, iFlow emulation tool, simulation mode, and then we can test uh, that uh, straight away from, uh, from there. As you can see, we uh, we have some possibilities, and we will go back, and we will be able to see how this got calculated. Uh, what we lack here is uh, we don't have um, much more details about it, so we can uh, see duration, but uh, we don't have a debug end. Um, so what we will do next is we will take the script out 
and we will put it in local environment where we'll put it under more precise um, test. And for this, as we could see, the script is quite uh, monolithic. So what we will do is we will uh, create a project for it. Uh, so I use IntelliJ IDEA, a uh, community edition, um, and we will place the original script uh, into the project. Here we go. So at this point of time, it's, uh, as I said, it's quite monolithic, so it, uh, it doesn't allow uh, us uh, much progression further on a more low level. So uh, the better way would be to decompose it and uh, to make it more modular. So what I do is instead of using this original script, I split it into um, modules. So for example, I decouple uh, the overall part of message processing. Then I use a separate method to create the payload. And within this method, I make a call to the last method, which is the long, uh, longest running method in here, which is calculation of the Fibonacci number. This is where I wrap the closure that we use. So here we have we just have a script. We haven't yet come to the execution part of the script. And how we can run it? So uh, in CPI, uh, this is Java-based um, uh, runtime, so it's JVM-based. And in JVM, uh, JVM follows the standard uh, GCR223, uh, which allows us to execute uh, scripts within the Java Visual Machine. This is exactly the case when we want to run Groovy script, or JavaScript, or some other scripts like Python, etc. So this approach, the way how uh, CPI runs the Groovy script or JavaScript, we can uh, run locally. The good point is uh, we, we have way more control over the environment. So we have way better defined boundary conditions. So we can um, have more control about where and what we execute. And we have more different and granular analysis uh, since the local environment will produce, uh, provide us a more feature-rich uh, toolbox for us. There are also some pitfalls and drawbacks that are associated with this option, uh, this um, approach. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, is environment representative enough? It will be really hard to uh, replicate and to mimic all um, small pieces of the way how CPA runs and where CPA runs. So we will not emulate uh, the runtime of CPA. Um, as well as there will be some differences in operating system and in allocated um, hardware that is used uh, for this, even though it's visualized in CPA, but still uh, it's very unlikely we will be able uh, to quickly reproduce it in a local environment. Otherwise it will take quite a lot of efforts. And next one is, uh, can the environment where we run or we, where we emulate the script is steady uh, environment? So can we reach the steady state uh, in the environment? The steady state means that uh, we can repeat executions of, of the tested uh, piece of code or the script and we are consistent in uh, the way how it gets executed and in results which we uh, receive. And there are quite a, a lot of different factors which might impact the steady state of the emulator. Uh, some of them are purely internal and the way how logic is implemented, and uh, some of them might be external to the script and uh, something that is specific to the environment itself. So the basic, uh, uh, the first thing I will do is uh, we will see how we can implement and how we can run this uh, environment locally. So for this, as I mentioned, we have um, the standard from Java that allows us to execute the GUI script. What we will have to do is we will have to instantiate the script engine for the particular um, scripting language, in this case, Groovy. We will need to load the script um, and invoke the method of the script. So what I will do is I will have the script in the CPI package and I constructed this script runner. And since we need to fit some data in, the header and the body, I will place it in two files. So we will have headers and we will have body. It will simplify um, if we will need to, to run the same script against different input um, uh, in the future. So now we run. What will, happens, uh, what will happen under the hood is the JVM will load the scripting engine. Um, then we will load the script from the given file into the scripting engine. We will uh, parse it and uh, invoke it. And in the output, we shall see exactly the same output as the script produces in CPI. Here we go. So at this point of time, we, uh, we can run the script locally. And that's not the only way how we can do it. So there are some shortcuts which Groovy provides. So they are not exactly the way how CPI runs, but this might be helpful when we want to run uh, the script locally. Uh, so we can use a Groovy shell. 
um, there is a graphical version of it, but what we will use is programmatic uh, interface so that um, it's just a bit quicker uh, from the developer perspective. But uh, the problem is it's not exactly the way how CPI executes the script. So we will not use this approach uh, to make performance measurements because we would like to uh, come close as much as possible uh, to what CPI does with the script. And the last one is uh, some uh, something that we can use the annotation. We can use annotation based script. So uh, this annotation, this approach is based on usage of um, abstract syntax tree. So what we do is we swap the base script that is used uh, by the runtime, by the local runtime in this case, and uh, we make uh, execution of the another script uh, from the session. So in here, we start with the script runner script, then we swap to the script, which is demo script, which is our tester script. We load the message and we process the message. We still get the same output as in the first option. So you can see that we have multiple ways how we can make the CPI script uh, executed locally. So in this case, we run it uh, once, uh, but we didn't measure anything. So uh, what we can do uh, for the measurement, and this is where I will get back to slides, the most basic approach is stopwatch. So stopwatch means that um, as we looked into CPI itself earlier, uh, we make uh, two timestamps, the first one before the measured code or block, the second one after, we find delta, and this delta is very rough estimation about how long did it take to execute the uh, measured code or block. And uh, from general perspective, we have two approaches how we can tackle it. Uh, the first one is we can use built-in APIs of the Java development kit, uh, uh, let's refer to it as a basic API. And uh, the second one is the abstraction layer API. So some um, libraries and some frameworks, they um, provide abstraction uh, to the uh, to the GDK APIs. And the one that we will look into is uh, the one that is provided by Apache Camel, since Camel is the framework integration framework that is heavily used by CPA. In the basic API, we have two options. We have current uh, a possibility uh, to measure milliseconds, and we have possibility to measure nano. Uh, seconds, nano time. I will not use nano time in this case, and the reason for this is, although it uh, sounds like it will be more precise, it's not always um, uh, the case. So milliseconds, uh, when we get uh, milliseconds, oh, we are sure that we will get milliseconds precision. Nanoseconds is high resolution time source, so it gives us nanosecond precision, but not always it will get us uh, give us nanosecond resolution, which means that um, Java Virtual Machine just it cannot uh, make uh, uh, time steps um, every nanosecond that will kill performance of the Java Virtual Machine itself. Uh, so it might be the case that uh, nano uh, time uh, will not be as precise as we will, uh, would think of it. And quite a lot of implementations, they actually don't use nano time. They rely on current time milliseconds. So let's get to the code. And I will go to stopwatch runner to illustrate these two examples. So um, I will not run the whole script. I will just uh, consider that we have some function that we will have uh, to measure. It it can be code block, it can be a single method or uh, whatever you would like to measure. The critical part is we put calculations of start and end time before and after, and we find duration as a delta between them. So the first one is a basic stopwatch using GTK. Uh, current milliseconds and the second one is uh, more advanced we use uh, the stopwatch class provided by camel and as you can see it's it might be seen as a bit more abstracted so if i run the stopwatch example now we'll actually execute both of them um, in the single run we will see that we can still execute the function we got uh, durations they are slightly different we will look into them a bit later because this is a really rough way how we can make measurements as i mentioned um, there are quite a lot of abstracted apis they still rely on uh, gdk so it's not something that is invented from, sc from scratch it's more a wrapper so let's have a look in the implementation in this case of apache camel implementation of the stop push class and as we can see um, the implementation is based on usage of the uh, basic API. So we use uh, system API from GDK, um, Stopwatch uses um, that API, and makes calculation in the very similar way as we did um, in the first approach when we used system API ourselves. Stopwatch is quick to run, it's quick to code, but it's not verbose enough. 
so it leaves us with some issues that uh, we cannot uh, have um, the information that will allow us to go deeper so we know how long does it take to execute but uh, when we need to look into what actually got executed within the measured um, code block we need uh, to look for some more advanced techniques and the, uh, the more advanced one uh, will be profiling so profiling is the way how we can um, it's a combination of techniques that uh, allows us to look into what happens with uh, the code when it gets executed and how runtime executes it so we can make some uh, measurements around uh, invocations of particular methods or group of methods we can look into ex uh, execution of uh, the call stack so what happens with the call stack and which methods get invoked and how long do they take and we can also look into some metrics like uh, consumption of memory consumption of input output depending on what is the uh, subject area of the script and what are metrics we are concerned about so what we actually measure and there are some uh, popular java profilers that we can use out there uh, some of them are built in uh, tools some of them are standalone and there is a fair mix of commercial tools and free tools uh, in this demo i will use um, the profiler that is provided by SAP, SAP JVM profiler, and uh, Visual VM to start with, and we will progress with another one, a sync profiler, at a later stage of the example. The reason why I will use SAP JVM is because uh, profiler is because CPI runs SAP JVM. I run uh, the script um, in a local environment in context of SAP JVM, and uh, why not to benefit from the um, infrastructure that um, SAP built around uh, JVM? And one of the tools that is very handy is the SAP JVM profiler, which is based on Eclipse. The whole profiler uh, set can be roughly split into um, big groups. The first one is uh, the most common one. It's the sampling profilers. Sampling profilers um, are easier to use, and uh, they can be used in production environments because they don't introduce a significant um, impact on performance of the executed runtime. Well, it could be that they can introduce, and we will see examples where uh, some profiled metrics they can heavily impact uh, runtime but in general they are more production environment friendly and the reason for this is they are not continuous profiling uh, they make frequent snapshots of the state of the java virtual machine and uh, then they make delta calculation between neighboring snapshots um, uh, to produce the measurement um, the fact that they are not continuous but they are just a series of snapshots uh, brings us uh, to less accuracy uh, especially if we have um, some fast calls that are executed, they might not be captured by the sampling profiler. And there are some other effects which are driven by the way how GVM makes um, snapshots um, is uh, something that is called safe points. So when we run, uh, for example, when the profiler runs thread dump to understand uh, thread states of and uh, call stacks of th uh, threads, you know, uh, which are active in uh, GVM, it cannot uh, do it at any random time. So uh, GVM uh, has to be in the safe position to make the consistent uh, thread dumping action. And this thread pos uh, safe position is called safe point, which means that uh, even though we trigger or profiler triggers uh, the thread dump action, the thread dump will not, might not be done uh, instantly by the Java virtual machine. So the Java virtual machine might need to reach the next safe point before it will make thread dump, and it might uh, introduce uh, less accuracy uh, to the profiling. The other group is instrumenting profilers, and they are way more uh, precise because they, uh, they are way more accurate because they are based on instrumentation of classes. So instead of making series of uh, thread dumps, what they do is they instrument classes which are executed, um, most commonly using the instrumentation API provided by Java, and then they can collect uh, metrics and information uh, from those. Uh, the problem with that is uh, they introduce significant performance overhead, and as a result, they are not production environment friendly they are highly discouraged to be used in production systems and a lot of profilers that are there on the market they are actually sampling profilers let's have a look so i've already started um as a pgvm profiler this is how it looks like so we have the separate perspective when we install add-on we can install it in uh, vanilla eclipse id or we can install it in Netviva Developer Studio or any other uh, compliance tool that is based on Eclipse platform. And what we will do is we will again run the script. What I will do is I will just introduce um, sleep time for 20 seconds so that I have enough time to, to start the profiler and uh, start uh, the profiling session. 
uh, so that we capture the uh, script execution. Uh, there are some profilers that you can plug in so that uh, they start profiling right at the application startup. And I will go with a simpler way so that we can reiterate and run it multiple times and quickly see results. So what I do now is I run the script runner once again, and instantly I switch to a GVM profiler. We see that we got the process. I go to performance hotspot analysis. Since I would like to look into performance execution uh, of methods uh, that get invoked by the script. And we can see that now uh, the profile is uh, in action. It makes samples, and this is exactly what we discussed uh, earlier, that um, since this is sampling based, uh, it makes a series of th um, samples or thread dumps. Now we got um, the application um, executed. We got some results, and we can look into them. So let's navigate to the main method, which is um, the one that uh, gets invoked and get, uh, gets, um, executes the query script. So we can see all methods that got invoked. Uh, got invoked. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that these are all uh, entirely methods, um, because as I mentioned, fast uh, methods, they could have been skipped. What we will be able to do is we will process data. We will be able to uh, to find uh, invocation of our script. We we'll just switch it to hierarchy so that it's right here now at the top. Like great. Let's have a look why. Okay, the reason for this is because it didn't get executed. Let's remove this and start it again. Here we go. Hotspot. We just wait until GUI script gets executed. And we're done. Let's get back to it. Now we shall see that. Yep, here we go. So that's the entry point. We can drill down from here to see not only just the list of methods that could capture, but also see the hierarchy of the executions. I will not expand it too deeply because we had recursive function. Uh, what we will be able to see is, for example, invocation of the method uh, that was called or the module that was called um, and subsequent calls we will be able to see reflection of uh, closure invocation and even that it was recursive closure invocation then we see that it got executed multiple times from each uh, one from the other instance that's a pretty nice way how we can visualize and how we can see uh, how much time was taken Another good uh, view is if we need to uh, go deeper and if we would like to look into what actually, uh, how the method got involved, which parameters were passed, uh, we can use method parameter definition, either from scratch or if we already have some example, we can take it from there. And this is exactly what I will do here. So we would like to see uh, which parameters were passed, how many times the closure was invoked and so on, because that's not something we will be able to see from the performance hotspot. Um, finish. Let's just make some meaningful names. This, okay. And what we will do now, we will close this. We will run again, but this time we will use method invocation, profiling. And we will select filter that we just got create, uh, created. Note that now it will take way longer uh, to execute the script. And the reason for this is um, we are sampling every invocation of the closure that got invoked, and it will be invoked many times. And it has overhead. So this is the overhead, the possible overhead that I spoke about uh, in sampling profilers. 
the more verbose profiling we will do, the uh, profile attack we will use, uh, the more impact we might potentially add. But still, it's not as uh, performance degrading as if it would be the case of instrumenting uh, profiler. So we are not uh, instrumenting all methods. We're just focused on specific one that we selected, uh, in this case, closure. You see how many times it was invoked. Now we don't capture snapshots. We capture information about invocations of those methods, uh, of that particular method, in our case, a single method. And then we can go to method parameters. And this is where we can get way more information about how many times it was invoked, how long did it spend, and we can progress and see which, in our case, we looked into input parameter. So we can see which input parameter values were passed to this closure. For example, this might be helpful if the same method is invoked multiple times with the different conditions, with the different input parameters, and we would like to understand if there is any pattern uh, and any performance uh, impact on different values that are passed to the method. So we can see which value, in this case, it was integer value uh, that was passed, how many times it was invoked, given that it's recursive, and this is naive implementation of uh, Fibonacci uh, sequence calculation. And we see that uh, it wasn't equal invocation uh, of the same closure, uh, closure for the different inputs. So this provides us a lot of insight. And together with this, if we're focused on some information, for example, if we have some memory hungry um, scripts, we can also look into uh, tracing of uh, information about memory. So we can uh, use different types of profilers within the CPGVM profiler uh, so that we can collect different metrics. For example, we can collect information about uh, the overall consumption of memory and look into which instances of which classes contributed to that consumption. Here, uh, the uh, GUI script wasn't memory hungry, it was more uh, CPU intensive and uh, it took longer time to execute. That's why we were focused on hotspot. Um, the other profiler that I will demonstrate just so that we see how we can collect uh, quite similar input with the different uh, tools is a visual VM profiler that is quite common in the Java community. And what we will do is we will run the same script And this time, we will make a collection of the trees. We run. Something is not good uh, with the GPM setup. I will need to check it later. So um, normally you would see possibility to run CPU uh, and memory profiling in the same way as you do in SAP uh, GPM profiler. I will skip this part. Uh, so what I wanted to demonstrate is uh, when we do CPU profiling in here, then we can um, reach out a very similar output as GVM profiler, although it will not be as verbose as the GVM profiler. And the interesting part is if we get back to the profiling session that we had, and if we run it, we might get different results. Of different profilers and the reason for this is the safe points that i mentioned that uh, different profilers might not be able to represent and to render the information in a similar way and this is a big pitfall i have to convert it um, and um for this we have to look some for some more advanced profilers and uh, the profilers that are ready uh, to make a snapshots not based on safe points that GVM provides, but on some um, more sophisticated techniques, such as um, async invocations. 
So uh, these profilers that uh, we looked into, they are based on uh, the, what GVM provides on making th uh, threat uh, DOMs. If we are looking for something that can collect information uh, outside of safe points, we will need to go down on the operating system level. So uh, it's not something that is available in Windows machines, uh, but it, it's available in Linux. So what we do is we literally collect a snapshot of the virtual uh, Java virtual machine from perspective of performance events that are triggered uh, for the operating system. I don't have Linux um, uh, standalone box uh, in my setup. What I will do is I will use Windows um, system, uh, subsystem Linux, and this is where we can emulate uh, examples. So I will do, uh, what I will do is, okay, I got the point. So uh, the reason why I, uh, the visual VM didn't work is because I wanted to show you a different example so that we don't look into deep call stack. Uh, we needed to invoke uh, to uh, introduce some arguments so that uh, we can connect uh, through GMX, uh, which SAP GVM profiler does natively, and for Visual VM we have to tweak it. Um, so we will step aside from an uh, example that we used earlier, and we will look into uh, some example that produces a random numbers generator and appends them to the string builder. So literally, it's quite a simple process, but it will show us different results that we see. So let us run this and collect it in uh, the profilers. So again, I will, it will run for quite a while. We firstly create a string builder. We reserve some space. Performance and in Visual VM. Now we shall be able to see it. Let's give another try. Yeah, we can see it. So just let it run for some period of time. Done. And now let's focus on result of uh, profilers. So we can see that uh, Visual VM profiler thinks that uh, the most time consuming operation uh, where it spent almost all the application spent almost all time is appending new numbers, uh, new characters to the string builder. If we look into Visual VM, uh, Java, uh, uh, SAP GVM profiler, and expand that trace, we can see that uh, SAP GVM profiler thinks that um, append was fairly quick, but where the time was spent is in delete operation. And if we look in the code, we firstly delete the first character, then we calculate some random number, and we append this random number. So we literally what happens under the hood is uh, we add uh, the character uh, sequence um, to the existing string builder, and we know the string build is big enough. So the capacity of the string builder is way bigger than length of the character sequences which are appended. We can see that the same result, uh, the different result is brought up uh, by two different profilers. And um, what we will do is, uh, it's actually because of safe points, because uh, uh, we need to look uh, a bit deeper and see what happens with the application uh, from the operating system perspective. For this, what I will do is I will navigate, I will execute this application from the console and I will use async profiler um, uh, to make a profiling session to capture the, uh, since we will need uh, to provide the process ID to async profiler, I will need to capture this process ID. I will use GPS, which is part of JDK to track, uh, execute the Java processes. Uh, there are, uh, async profiler, I will run it in console, um, but there are some tools like IntelliJ um, Ultimate Edition that provide it uh, within the tool, but communication doesn't have it. So uh, I will just demonstrate it from the command line. And we will need to run the same application. Let's start watching. Let's start execution. And we see that the process shall pop up now. There we go. One, five, eight. And we will just profile for 10 seconds to see a different output for the same application. And we're done. Um, as you can see here, it's a bit more verbose, and we can see that uh, the time where the application spent most of its time was deletion from string builder 
uh, in particular when I tried to, to copy the array because the deletion uh, we deleted the first character which means that all characters which existed in string builder they have to be moved to the beginning uh, uh, of the string builder and for this uh, Java has to literally copy the entire array of the character sequence which corresponds to what we saw in the CPGVM profiler so that's um, quite precise information that we could achieve and you can see that uh, uh, tools sometimes sometimes they might introduce confusion to you when you analyze so it might lead to uh, inaccurate uh, analysis for that online okay so um, let's hold on with profiling uh, for time being so we can look into details but still they are mostly based on one time execution because we will, wouldn't like to profile uh, lots of uh, volume executions of the tested code because literally we will be drawn with uh, data that is collected by profiler the next stop is how we can make uh, benchmarkings, how we can execute benchmark um, over iterative execution of the script. Because if we if we achieved the uh, steady state of the application, then we would like to collect some statistics. We would like to see um, how the application be behaves potentially uh, in volume cases. And also we have to make some precaution because GVM does some optimizations. Um, for example, it can introduce some dead code elimination if the code is not used. Uh, it can optimize loops, constant behavior, so constant folding is something that GVMs commonly will do. And uh, there might be some overhead that GVM will tackle during profiling that we wouldn't like to catch in our measurements, in accurate measurements. So for this, we switch to another technique which is based on benchmarking uh, over synthetic tests. And here we have three big groups of benchmarking tests that we can arrange. The first one is the highest macro benchmarking is on the on the application level. Then we drill down to module level, and the one that we will focus is the most precise is method level benchmarking. So for this, uh, GVM profiler is not of great use, and we have a different set of uh, tools that can be used. And uh, some of most common and popular tools are Google Caliper, uh, GMH, Java Micro uh, Benchmark Harness. And uh, micro benchmark suite that got uh, embedded into GDK uh, 12 onwards. Given that CPI currently runs on SAP GVM 8, Java 8, uh, we will use GMH as our example. Uh, there are different flavors how we can invoke and make use of G uh, GMH. Originally, it was developed as a Maven archetype for those who use Apache Maven. Uh, you can also um, execute it through the runner uh, classes which are available in GMH. Um, since I use Gradle in my uh, project, I will use the plugin that is provided for Gradle. So I'll, I will need to add extra plugin to Gradle and uh, we can customize it uh, afterwards um, uh, so that we literally introduce this feature to the project. For benchmarks, the uh, important part and the most complex part is uh, to understand uh, how we develop uh, benchmarks. And if benchmarks that uh, we create, are uh, reasonably uh, fine. So this is quite sophisticated task and we have to be in mind about what kind of Java uh, optimizations uh, GVM does so that we don't step into pitfalls and we don't get inaccurate results. Uh, we can pass some arguments about uh, benchmarking, uh, about tweaking uh, directly through the command line interface when we invoke it or through the runner. In my case, I used uh, annotations, so quite a lot of information about how we would like to run benchmark or what type of benchmark we would like to run. For example, uh, do we want to calculate average or do we want to sample? Uh, do we want to run uh, extra profilers uh, with this? For how long we would like to run it? Uh, this all can be custom uh, customized and configured. We can use parameterization uh, in benchmarks uh, so that we can uh, have multiple different inputs for the benchmarking session. And uh, we can also introduce similar to unit tests. It's actually based, um, it's, it shall be quite familiar for the developers from the perspective of structured unit tests. Uh, we can introduce uh, some methods that will prepare test data or prepare environment, and then they will decompose environment through the setup and teardrop methods. And we can uh, flexibly configure whether we would like to run something on the entire uh, benchmark level, whether we would like to run it on invocation level, etc. You might note that uh, aside from setup, we can also define uh, what we would like to benchmark. And this is the actual benchmarking uh, execution that will run iteratively. So we can define uh, 
how long we would like to warm up Java virtual machine, which is quite critical aspect uh, uh, for benchmarking because we don't want to run benchmarks in the cold Java virtual machine. We would like to preheat it. And this is something that can be done uh, through configuration so that the actual benchmarking, the measurement will take overheated, warmed up uh, virtual machine. In this way, we can get uh, more accurate results. And there are some other uh, tricks uh, that we can use in GMH in order to uh, tackle the issues, of, not issues, but optimizations of the GVM that might introduce issues to benchmarking. They can be introduced through um, certain classes uh, and APIs or through annotation methods or arguments. So we run the same script and you can see that we will run two benchmarks in here. So we will run the benchmark for the whole script execution and just for the part that speaks about uh, calculation of the Fibonacci number. For this, we have set of tasks, Gradle tasks that are introduced with the plugin. We will run Gradle GMH, which will help us. What it does under the hood is it compiles uh, the benchmarking jar file that is not just a jar file of the application, but it has quite a lot of extra instrumentation that is required for uh, the benchmarking session. I'll just increase it. Do you have four can... minutes left? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we see that the benchmarking started. So we see warm up sessions, we see actual iterations uh, that are benchmarked. Uh, in this particular case, it was average benchmarking, uh, average time benchmarking. So in the output, we will be able to see um, how long did it take to execute benchmarked methods uh, within the benchmarking session. And if we look in the build folder, we will be able to see quite a lot of generated resources, such as generated classes that are used by the benchmark. So uh, the, the GMH will not execute the code uh, as a standalone code, it will execute quite heavily instrumented and opinionated uh, version of this code. This is quite a nice way and it's uh, intensively used by performance engineers when they would like to uh, put some code or some you see, methods or just a single method on the test. We can provide different input criteria for the benchmarking so, uh, executions so that we can test how the code will behave with the different input conditions. Um, again, the critical part is that we need to ensure that we run it in representative environment because any deviations, like for example, some applications that, that run in the background and that consume CPU um, or a um, JVM uh, configuration, it might heavily impact uh, the output of the benchmarking session. And the results that we will get out uh, of GMH run, uh, they are statistical figures that we, uh, we can analyze and then we can optimize the code and rerun the same benchmarking again and again. We can run it iteratively or even automatically, but we have to put it um, under quite precise analysis of what we actually measured or where we measured and what result means for us. So let's see how it looks like in the output. We're nearly done. There we go. Uh, so we got uh, two benchmarks that we did for, for two methods. Uh, we got uh, the score, which is average, and uh, we got the error. It's not the error as such, it's a, it's a score error. So the score error is the margin of the error uh, within the score. So literally it's um, half of the confidence level, kind of plus minus. So the higher it is, uh, the less we are confident in the result. The, uh, this means that this is an indicator something is might be wrong or we didn't achieve steady state of the benchmark or something is wrong with the environment or might be we need to look into um, uh, optimization that we have to do. So that's another tool in our toolbox, which is really great uh, for performance uh, analysis. And um, that's it for the benchmarking part. And as promised, for the Fibonacci, uh, it was naive implementation. So the last thing that we need to uh, think about is when we optimize performance, do we have any uh, other factors that might be impacted? So we use naive implementation in uh, our example. Um, we can optimize performance, but also uh, we might introduce some other issues when we optimize performance. So here I just put an example of multiple imp implementations of Fibonacci number using some groovy um, uh, capabilities like trampolining and normalization for caching, uh, tail recursion, different way uh, how to implement uh, Fibonacci uh, sequence uh, calculation. 
So when we look into performance results, be cautious not only about what you measured, how you measured, and how you interpret it, but also if there are any other impacts that might be introduced by performance optimizations. So all together, this will uh, lead your custom development just to, to a different level, to a better level of quality and uh, stability. Thank you for this session, for listening uh, to me. I will now unplug and I will be happy to, to see your questions in one of unconference uh, Discord channels. So thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Good, 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 good.